to see all of you and or if I can see a few videos and screensavers and pictures and names. Um, as Laura mentioned, my name is Mark. I'm, I might have met some of you in the travels across the state of Connecticut. Um, in addition to um, being a professor at Yale, I also am the co-creator of Ruler, which is an evidence-based approach to SEL that's in about 250 of Connecticut schools now. And um, I'm just excited to meet with all of you and share some of the things that we're working on. Um, and hopefully we can learn together and how to help people get through these difficult times. Um, so maybe we can just get settled in our seats. I know I'm like this already, my shoulders are already in my ears and I'm like so tense. I'm just like, okay, I gotta chill out a little bit. Anybody else feeling like they've been tense for the last six months? <laughs> yeah, and we know that it's okay. Well, it's not okay. We gotta do something about it. So, Laura, just to double check, can you see my screen? Okay, great. And just so everyone knows, my um, the way I like to do things is interactively. So um, I'm going to ask for you to have lots of participation today, and, and we'll jump from there. So um, a few things. One, day job. I run the Center for Emotional Intelligence. We are 60 people now, uh, incredibly, who are uh, scientists and practitioners who essentially are running around the state of Connecticut, the United States, the world, trying to get people to talk about their feelings um, and also learn strategies on how to use them wisely. Um, maybe I'm going to ask you another quick question. How many of you have, over the last six months, used an emotion regulation strategy that you're not like overly proud to share today? Anyone know what I mean by that? Like maybe you've kind of not used your emotions so wisely at home with your family or friends or working with others. Um, maybe I'm the only one. Um, the joke in my family, I have my, my mother-in-law came to stay with us in March. She's from Panama and um, she came for a wedding. Lo and behold, who knew? All flights to Panama would be canceled until September. So um, she lived with us for seven months. And um, I think by the third month, we're like, are we going to get through this? By the fifth month, we're like, I need to create a fundraiser so that I can hire a plane to take this woman back to Panama. And by the sixth month, um, I don't know what was going on, to the point where she looked at me one day and she said to me, you know, are you really the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence? And I said to myself and to her, sort of, well, not tonight. <laughs> Anyway, it was not a good evening. Um, no one else has had that experience over the last six months? Like just like a little meltdown here and there? Come on, don't make me feel so lonely. Okay, good. Don't feel it's okay. We're all going to just come out today in terms of our dysregulation. Um, so I like to use social media for the good. And uh, so if anything resonates with you today, please feel free to um, use these handles from Twitter to Facebook to Instagram and go to websites to learn more afterwards. Maybe we should start with a quote just to settle ourselves. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through. How? you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in by Haruki Murakami. So I'm gonna ask all of you in your own words, phrase, how does this quote resonate with you? What does it make you think about? This is called the counselor participation part of the webinar. So if you want to drop that in the chat because everyone's muted, like forcibly muted. Um, That's what I'm asking. That would... We can just type it into the chat. Thank you, Laura. Yep. So growing during crisis, coming together, we're stronger than we realize, resilience. All 
I'll give you just one thing that I have become much more aware of, I mean, probably 3,000 things, is gratitude. Um, I did a study with 1,000 people across the United States in May, kind of the height of the pandemic. And I asked people what they were grateful for. And what I was fascinated by was that people um, spoke about, like, I'm grateful for my finances, I'm grateful for my home, I'm grateful for my family. Um, but no one talked about, like, the outer circles. Like, I'm grateful for the grocery store clerk. I'm grateful for the nurses who are pregnant, who are going to work each day. You know, I'm grateful for just the, the people who are the backbone, you know, of our country who, you know, in many ways put themselves at risk for all of us to have comfort. And, um, and it was just something that I've been stuck with because I was fascinated that only 1% of the people, the, the thousand people that I studied in this project even mentioned something outside of their kind of immediate comforts. Now, this is a tool we call the mood meter. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, but um, as someone who's taught this probably 50,000 times, um, I thought it would just be to kind of share with you a little bit about the tool. So a lot of people ask the question, I'm sure you ask it all the time in your work, how are you feeling? A lot of people teach kids feelings, there's feelings charts, there's emoji charts. And what I found is that a lot of them are not very comprehensive. The mood meter, from my perspective, perspective um, and the research that I've done for 25 years, really is kind of the, the tool that helps us to be the most comprehensive about how we're feeling. On the x-axis, it says the word pleasantness. Think about it. You all woke up this morning thinking that at noon, you get to talk with some guy from New Haven, Connecticut about feelings. Maybe you were like, I have no words. Or maybe you woke up thinking to yourself, maybe I shouldn't attend. <laughs> That's pleasantness. So I'm gonna ask you all right now, where are you in terms of your level of pleasantness? Minus five, this is the worst experience of your life. Plus five, you have no words. On the y-axis, it says the word energy. Energy literally is your physical and your mental energy. Plus five, you're so energized you can't contain yourself. Minus five, you just feel like falling back into bed and pulling the covers over your head. So let's start off with our color this morning. I'm gonna ask everyone to use their chat. Uh, what color are you in today? Que color? We have green, blue, a lot of greens and greens and greens and greens and greens and yellow. Yellows and greens. A little blue. A little red. Looks like we got a majority of yellow and green. Interesting. I'm gonna show you some research we've done in a minute. Here's what I'd like you to do now. I'd like you to convert your color to the precise feeling words uh, or word. You got three seconds. Two, one, go. Content, calm, excited, tired, worn out, content. Tired but here, mostly content, motivated, calm. Tired but hopeful, mellow. Static, productive, that's a cool one. Let me ask you another quick question. How many of you found it a little challenging to go from like the color to kind of choosing the word? Just give me a quick yes, no. So a lot of us, like so far 90%. So here we are, people who are trained in counseling and psychology, social work. Um, what are your hypotheses around that? If you were to become researchers at our center and 
generate hypotheses for why, by the way, people who are school counselors are struggling to find the words or can't find the right words, what would be your, we need to work on identifying our own feelings. It takes time to reflect. So many mixed emotions. I can relate to that. We've got to expand our vocabulary. We're used to helping others, not being self-reflective. Constant change. Great points. So one of the things that I've learned in my 25 years running around is that a lot of social and emotional learning is about schools buying programs and kits that then teachers implement and sometimes counselors implement. Um, but it's not really about building a common language throughout the entire school or district or in my vision state. Um, so that everyone is on the same page in terms of how they talk about feelings and how they label feelings. Does that resonate with you? How many of you have worked in a school that has kind of bought the kit or done the assembly or had the speaker or the workshop on SEL? Just for curiosity. Give me another yes if you've done that. Get a lot of yeses. Yeah. How many of you believe that your school has a systemic approach to SEL that involves infusing the principles of social and emotional learning into the way leaders lead. So the leaders are actually going through their own developmental process, how educators and teachers and staff all work with each other and with students, how students learn and how families parent. It's just built into the pedagogy, the policies, the cultural climate. You know, I see a couple, maybe yes, we're working on it, making progress, a lot of no's. And I think, you know, honestly, just to be completely transparent, I've come to the uh, conclusion that um, if we throw one more kit at a teacher to teach like stress management or mindfulness or anger reduction or I statements, um, like we're just never gonna get anywhere. Here's the best example. I visited a school recently. Well, recently is like eight months ago. And um, I was walking in the hallway with the principal of the school and the principal was trying to convince me how excellent you know, their work was in social and emotional learning. I'm not a judge, I'm just listening. And so she said to me, you know, we do, everybody's been trained in mindfulness and everybody's been trained in how to promote grit and everybody's been trained in I statements and everybody's been trained in, I can't even think of like 10 different things. I was like, wow, that's impressive. Then we're walking by a classroom where a teacher was kind of losing it with the student. And here's what happened. And if you can see me, this is what I saw like looking through the window. This gritted teeth, these furrowed eyebrows. When you speak to me this way, I feel angry. And I looked over at the prince, I'm like, looks like you got the I statements down. No, I didn't do that actually. I wanted to do it <laughs> because I think that the, that whole way of thinking about it is wrong. Um, you know, the I statements are fine, as we all know, but that doesn't shift the culture and climate. That doesn't make kids feel safe and welcome. That doesn't help kids necessarily identify their feelings in helpful ways and regulate effectively. Does this resonate at all with you? Just curious. Okay. I just want to make sure I should keep going. So now is the time for all of you to just take a moment and think about your own regulation strategy. You know, I know it's hard to attend these things. I have to do Zoom meetings all freaking day. It's like, oh, I wake up having nightmares about it. Um, so we're going to be here for about 45 more minutes. And that's, you know, not that long, but it can, you know, be draining. 
you got other stuff on your plates. My hunch is that many of you were double or triple dipping during my webinar, kind of sneaking in a text here, you know, doing a little email there, filling out a report there. Um, so I'd like to know from all of you what your strategies are. Like really, to get the most out of our time together, what's your strategy? Can everybody just share what their momentary 45 minute strategy is mindful? Lists, notes, stay present. Go for a run during my presentation. Jot down ideas, soak in. Engage, a lot of note taking. Being present. Okay. So mindfulness, writing lists, taking notes, being present. Go for the run. We'll do that one later. Thank you very much. Jot down ideas. That's kind of notes. Engage. Some breathing exercises. Shutting the door. So you're supporting children all day long, right? That's much of your work, supporting probably some educators. And so let's say we just put a list of these strategies in the classroom, like the kid who has had trauma over the last six months, parents are going through a divorce because they can't stand each other after being with each other for so long. Um, the kid is kind of feeling down, scared, lonely, angry, lots of feelings. And then on the classroom wall, there's a list of strategies. Be mindful, write a list, be present, jot down your ideas, engage, breathe. What do you think? What are your thoughts? I'm just curious. Now, some of you are like, I hate this guy already. He's making fun of my strategy. I'm not making fun of your strategy. They're all real things. But what do you think? What is, what is it? What do we learn about emotion management? It takes time. It's not easy. Can't be too simplified. It's got to be personalized. It's a process. We stink, our expectations are high. <laughs> it looks different to different, looks different to different people. One thing that's fascinating to me is that, you know, we as a America in general like to latch on to like the strategy that everybody thinks is the answer. Uh, right now the answer is mindfulness. Um, which is not a bad thing, by the way, and try to be mindful a lot of the time. I'm sure many of you do too. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, as you probably know, the mental health in our nation has diminished over the last 20 years, but um, the last six months in particular. And um, we for example, at Yale, where I work, about 60% of our undergraduates are doing something to support mental health challenges. 60%. I'm going to repeat that now. 6%. 60%. 60%. And I went to the counseling center last year. And I'm like, so what's going on here? And they said, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's stressed out. It's gone up 20% a year for the last six years. And so we're just, we're adding more yoga classes to the campus and more mindfulness classes. It's like, okay. So I went back to my class that I teach on emotional intelligence. And I asked students to journal for a couple of weeks about all the things that they were stressed out about. 
lo and behold, what I found was they were not really stressed. Their primary emotion was envy, that the things that were quote unquote stressing them out were this kid's more, this kid doesn't have to study as much as I have to study to get A's. This kid's got a parent who's more connected than me. This one, this, this one, that, this one, that, this one, that, this one, this. And then they're on social media for six hours looking at all these images. And so the number one feeling was envy. So I went back to the counseling center. I said, I'm just curious, like how much of the treatment and the work that you're doing with our students is like on envy management. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, well, this is what the research is showing among the students. And again, they said like, well, we're offering more and more mindfulness classes. We're offering more and more downward dog. And I said, well, you know, where's the study which shows that downward dog reduces envy? Now, um, the one thing I'm happy about is that I have tenure because I thought I was going to, I could have gotten fired if I probably had said that five years prior. But um, do you see the frustration? I mean, do you feel it in terms of like, we just don't take our children, college students, high school students, elementary, middle, elementary, you know, students, we don't take mental health seriously. We think it's just like throw a little mindfulness program, throw a little yoga. And I do yoga and mindfulness, but if I'm envious all day long, right, I need something to shift my cognition. That's your cheat sheet, by the way. I think Laura showed you my book. So on the inside of my book, you get the cheat sheet of all the feeling words. So as I mentioned, you know, never before in my career have I seen these data, a 67% increase in parents who reported feeling anxious or depressed all day, 42% increase in children's externalizing behaviors compared to 2018 in April, 2020, eight times more likely adults are to report serious mental distress. And um, I think certainly we've now learned that we have not been equitable in nearly anything we've done in our country. Um, and so we know that our BIPOC communities have a higher chance of contracting the virus, have greater needs, less access to healthcare, and higher mortality rates. So I asked all of you how you were feeling. Well, this is what educators across the country shared they were feeling back in March and then over the summer. So I asked 6,000 educators across the United States, how are you feeling? That's how they felt in March. And then I said, well, how do you anticipate you'll be feeling in the new school year? Anxious. Does this resonate with you in terms of your school population right now? I'm just curious. Okay. But all of you said you were calm and content and tranquil and peaceful. You like the chosen ones. You're like, gosh, I'm like envious of all of you. I'm like, a, I'm emotionally bankrupt. Um, when we ask teachers broadly, more all educators, how they want to feel, this is what we found. Confident, excited, happy, safe. So let's think about that. We're feeling anxious and overwhelmed but we want to feel excited, confident, and safe. And so if we go back to that mood meter, um, you know, we're kind of emotionally out of balance, right? Think about it. We're in that left side a lot. We're saying we want to be in the right. And I think this brings up a lot of problems in our nation, which is there are more books written about the pursuit of happiness than there are kids in Connecticut schools. And it brings up the question, like, is that really the solution to be happy all the time? Um, anyone, else, anyone else ever try to be happy all the time and watch that it backfires? It's like we're not programmed to be happy all the time. Think about right now. I'm still feeling anxious about everything. Um, and so, like to tell me not to be anxious is weird and tell me I have to be happy, that's also weird. That brings me to the goal of this whole presentation, which is to just share with you the way we think about emotions in our center. Because our goal is to create 
a healthier and more equitable, innovative, and compassionate society. What I've argued is that there is a step that comes before even doing work in social and emotional learning or learning the skills of emotional intelligence. This is why when I wrote my book, I called it permission to feel, not social and emotional learning or emotional intelligence. Because what I've learned running around the world is that most of us don't feel like we have the permission to be our true feeling selves. Does this relate to you? Does this, does this concept of like not feeling like we can be our true feeling selves, authentic feeling selves, whether it be at school, at home? And you know, you're all counselors, so I hope this doesn't activate you in any ways. But um, a lot of people don't know my own story, and I'm just going to share briefly what, a little bit about my history. Um, I was terribly abused as a child by a neighbor um, from when I was five years old until I was about 10. So five years of pretty horrific sexual abuse by a neighbor who happened to be the head of the boys club in our city, which you can only imagine how many victims there were. And he threatened me. I was not allowed to share what was happening. It was pretty horrific. Um, and so you imagine what it feels like to be in a situation like that hatred, disgust, fear, anxiety, I mean, the list goes on, and not having no place to go with those feelings. Now, I grew up in New Jersey. I had two parents who I knew loved me. My mother had terrible anxiety. She would say things like, oh my goodness, like when I would share something that was going wrong in school, don't tell me the details, I'll have a breakdown. And my father was a tough guy from New York City who'd say things like, son, you gotta toughen up. So I learned very quickly early in my life, like, can't tell mommy how you're feeling because she'll have a breakdown. Daddy's just going to tell you to be a tough guy. And so for most of my life, I was, in my early life anyway, I was trapped with these feelings. <clears throat> and when I would come home and like, I hate you and I'm not going to school tomorrow, I would get punished for my behavior. Um, and no one ever really knew how I felt. So I've learned that, you know, this concept is pretty important. And I'm just curious to know from all of you, when you think about the term permission to feel in your context as counselors, as people, as humans, like what does it make you think about? What is the first word or words that come to mind to you? authentic and genuine, letting go, true self. Honest, confident. Real, letting go, safety. Things are going to suck sometimes. Vulnerability. Openness. So in my book, what I shared and I've dedicated my whole career to my uncle is that I was blessed that my uncle actually was a school counselor. I can't believe I just remember that. He was a school counselor in upstate New York. And he's actually getting his master's in school counseling at Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey, where, near where I lived. And he would stay um, with my family once in a while when he'd come down to do his weekend classes. And for whatever reason, he was the only adult that I ever disclosed what was happening to me. And when I think back, it was his facial expressions, it was his body language, it was his vocal tone, it was his all the things that you're coming up with, you know, he was, he made me feel safe. He made me feel validated. He was vulnerable himself. And so it was that day that I felt I finally, you know, have what I now call permission to feel. 
I'm curious, you know, in my travels around, I don't find that everybody has an Uncle Marvin. And I don't want to get too personal with all of you, but I wonder if you had a person who helped you to be your full, unconditional, true feeling self. Parent, coach, friend, teacher, brother, sister, aunt, uncle. And, you know, I share this with you because a lot of us, a lot of people didn't have an Uncle Marvin. Um, one of my most amazing experiences uh, in my career was when my book came out, I went on a tour and I was giving speeches about this concept. And I asked people, you know, who was your Uncle Marvin? And from what I described about my uncle, one gentleman says, he goes, Mark, I think this is really weird, but your Uncle Marvin was my Uncle Marvin. I'm like, what? He said, your uncle was my teacher, was my counselor 45 years ago. And I'll never, ever forget him. It blew my mind. Of course, I was like, you're not going anywhere. I got to interview you. And what I learned just blew me away, you know, about the way my uncle made people feel. And so, you know, it's interesting because people have now said to me, well, Mark, for whom are you the Uncle Marvin? I'm like, Ugh. I'm a workaholic, you know, I'm not really giving, you know, all that I received. So much of what you came up with is um, here, when I ask people for those characteristics in my research, compassionate, empathic, non-judgmental, supportive, accepting. Let me ask all of you, any of these characteristics that you think you might want to work on for your own development? Anyone willing to be non judgmental? I know it's so hard. Oh. I know I'm sure a lot of you in your roles are trying, you know, that fix your be more vulnerable, non judgmental, patient. You know, it's interesting. I was being interviewed the other day. Actually, Ruler is going to be on CBS this morning, tomorrow. And I was interviewed, and this person who was interviewing me, uh, I was sharing a little bit about my story, and she was, I can see this person was not comfortable. This person was a doctor, by the way. And she's like, can we just talk about the research now? And I was like, sure, you know, not a problem. I'm just gonna like shut down my whole person. Um, and I find that that's one of the challenges that we face, isn't it? In our work, in our school, in schools, is that some people are just, they're just, not prepared. But this is why we can't just like throw the SEL program and say, go do this in your classroom. <laughs> and so I won't go into a lot of detail here today because I think a lot of you know this, but for anyone who's a naysayer, I just say, you don't know the research. Emotions matter for everything, right? From our attentional capacity, from how our brains operate during stressful times to decision making to the quality of our relationships, right? Emotions are signals to approach or avoid. Just curious, do any of you work with some colleagues who are really difficult? Anyone work with someone who's difficult at their school? And how many of you, when you think about that person who's really difficult, say to yourself something like, oh, I want to work with this person for the rest of my life. <laughs> right? It's like, oh my goodness, I can't take it. Why do I get up in the morning? So emotions are the drivers of our relationships, our physical and mental health, right? Our performance and our creativity. One of the things I've written a lot about over the last year is why we need to create a generation of emotion scientists as opposed to emotion judges. Just take a minute and look at these. Where do you seem to fall? And of course, we're all going to say we're emotion scientists, but 
I think sometimes we do fall into that emotion judge category. What do you say to yourself when you fail at regulating? Do you say, all right, Mark, you did a shitty job today at dealing with your mother-in-law, but tomorrow's another day. Or are you the kind of emotion judge who has that fixed mindset, which is, you know, she's a trigger for me. I can't take it anymore. This is the way it's going to be. You know, where I work, I'm fascinated by how many emotion judges there are. Um, it just blows my mind. Um, you know, they think emotions are weak, right? That cognition rules feeling. What people don't know is that it's the other way around. And some of us are a little bit of both. You're right. Some people have told me, Mark, I'm the emotion scientist with like the students that I help but I'm an emotion judge with all my friends and family. Maybe you can relate to that. So the question is, so what are the skills? And ruler is a set of skills, recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotions. And of course, if we had more time, I could go through all these skills in greater detail. But what I've learned is that the R, the U, and the L is helping us to identify our feeling states. What's going on in my body? What's going on in my brain? What might be causing my feelings? And then what do I do with those feelings? So I'm going to ask all of you right now, I'm going to do your little test of emotional intelligence. And whoever gets this right first, I will send you a free copy of my book. All right, here we go. What is the psychological difference between anger and disappointment. Go, no cheating. Perceived injustice, disappointment is self-directed, nothing, none, nothing. Perception, fear, reaction. Outward, inward, anger is secondary. Perception, self-regulation. But what is the psychological difference between the two? Shame, outward, inward. Do you see how not, it's just not that simple. So, Right, the psychological difference is that disappointment, as someone said, is about unmet expectations. And Denise Tafuto, you win. Disappointment is unmet expectations. Anger is reaction to injustice or perceived injustice. So do you see there are differences? Now, the question is, does it matter that we, as the adults who are working with kids, have that ability to be granular about our feelings. Doesn't matter. Yes or no? You have to say yes. Why? Because as we say, you have to name it to tame it. You gotta be able to label it to regulate it. Because um, the strategies that we would use to help someone manage anger and disappointment would be completely different from the most part. Right, think about it, disappointment, everything was legit, but you just didn't have the expectation that. David, when I say granular, I mean getting really specific and honing in on the feeling. So people say, I'm stressed. Well, what if, when you're stressed, are you overwhelmed? Are you anxious? Are you worried? Are you apprehensive? Um, and the reason why that's important is that each of these concepts have a different meaning, right? Stress is too many demands not enough resources. Anxiety is about uncertainty. Fear is about impending danger. So the more granular we can get and specific, the more we can communicate clearly and the better we can regulate. Now, the E and the R have to do with expressing and regulating emotions. So what do we do with those feelings? 
think about this, there are rules in society about who has the permission to express. You know, I'm writing a paper right now with a friend of mine here uh, who's a professor in the psychiatry department who's an African-American psychologist. I'm a white Jewish neurotic psychologist. And um, the rules are different for each of us when you think about it. If we're walking down the street expressing anger, isn't he going to be perceived differently than me? Definitely. So this brings up why we can't just be focusing on helping kids or teachers, right? We've got to think about this from a systemic level. We've got to create permission to feel societies, emotionally intelligent cultures and climates. Regulating emotions, the strategies that we use to regulate. So when we think about emotion regulation, it's about the self-regulation, it's about co-regulation, it's about helping other people to regulate. And I think some important things about emotion regulation is that it's specific to the feeling. Like the 90s were my anger years, I'm kind of done with anger, and now I'm chronically overwhelmed. They're specific to the person. There's no correct strategy for you or me. It's based on my personality, my cultural background, it's specific to the situation and relationship. You can't use the same strategies in every situation. Like you can't go for a run when you're giving your presentation, like, oh my God, I'm so stressed out from all these counselors. I'm going for a run. Can't do that. It's a good idea, though it's raining out. Um, but I can go for a run later. Obviously, we all need a lot of practice. Somehow or another, there's this misconception, and I can't deal with it anymore, that people think it's about controlling. The last thing we want to do is control people's feelings. What we want to do is help people use their emotions wisely. Obviously, we need to be emotion scientists about our strategies to see if they're working. And we got to remind ourselves over and over again, there's no correctness. And I think this is where the big problems come in because teachers and other many of us just want the right answer. Like, what's the right strategy? I'm like, there is no right strategy. It's about self-discovery and learning what strategies work best for me to achieve well-being and relationships, you know, and goals. So it's really about helping ourselves and our kids become emotion scientists. And obviously, you know this, you know, getting into that good stress zone is great. Like I love to hire people who have a little bit of stress problems, right? It gets stuff done. They're pushed, they're motivated. It's when it becomes that acute, you know, um, toxic stress, you know, that we're burnt out. So the last thing I want to share with you for right now is what we've learned is that there are these areas of regulation, right? First is permission to feel. Second is this kind of biological stuff. As we now know, our nutrition, our sleep, our exercise, all are inextricably linked to how we regulate. A lot of parents say to me, you know, Mark, I'm, I'm trying to be better in the morning, but I'm just, I have such a short fuse. And I'm like, well, how's your sleep? Terrible. I'm like, there you go. So your sleep is going to predict whether or not you're going to use those strategies in a good way. As you all know, if we don't deal with physiological regulation, we're never going to be able to have communication. So what I mean by that specifically is that oftentimes we try to have conversations when kids are activated, but it doesn't work. None of us can make that happen. Our brains aren't responding. People often talk about self-care as like, like it's a trigger because like, I don't have the opportunity to take a bubble bath. Um, I don't even have a bathtub in my house. So it's not about bubble baths, right? Self-care is about finding the things that bring you meaning and purpose and joy. For me, it's taking sometimes just a five minute walk to just like get some fresh air. Obviously relationships. Are you that Uncle Marvin? Um, I'm sure most of you are trained in some kind of cognitive work in terms of whether it be CBT or whether it be supporting children having more positive versus negative self-talk. And then finally, you know, just having those routines that work for you, setting up your day. So for me, this has to do with being trying to be my best self in the morning, maybe for you. Let me ask everyone to take a nice long inhale and a nice long exhale. 
and just bring yourself into the moment. There's a few last things I just want to share with you and then be happy to take some questions. So let me just, if you're familiar with Ruler, you know our goal is to move from a piecemeal to more systemic work. And I won't go through all this with you today, but I'm going to ask you as the counselors in your schools to evaluate what's really happening. Right, what's the mindset? Is everybody on the emotions matter bus? Or how many naysayers do you got? Is your school working with the adults continuously to support them in deepening their own social and emotional skills? Is your school working in building a healthier emotional climate? Is your school working on infusing the principles of emotional intelligence and social emotional into pedagogy practices and policies, so suspension policies. Because what we find in our research is that the only real outcomes, um, or the only way we're going to achieve the real outcomes is by um, addressing all four of these aims. And by the way, I'm happy to give you all my PowerPoint, so have no fear. Available for free. So in Ruler, what we do is we work with adults and students from pre-K through high school. We have outside of school time work. We have content for families. As a matter of fact, we have units for every single grade level um, from pre-K, early childhood, all the way up to high school. And they differentiate. So the early childhood work is obviously teacher-led with core routines. And elementary school, we use the understanding by design framework with core units. and building a positive classroom culture climate, being self-aware, learning strategies to help us manage. Middle school uses more project-based learning and high school really is about students directing the learning. So just a few things about lasting change. I think the first is, and what I need your help with, is we gotta get everybody to learn the science of emotion and emotional intelligence. That emotions are not disruptive, they're actually useful. We gotta understand that SEL skills are hard, not soft skills. These are the skills that people want. We gotta move beyond the whole happiness is the answer. Research shows that the more you strive for it, actually the worse you're gonna feel over time. It also denies the full kind of humans that we are. I don't know about you, but I just see how much money we spend on crisis interventions and we don't spend enough time on prevention. Kind of eliminate the quick fixes, right? Put an end to the train and hope model. So Karen, you're saying, isn't this another kit? It's really not because it doesn't work that way because the whole first year is all about adults learning the emotion language to help them be more granular. It's also built into staff development forever in terms of reflecting on like, how are the triggers that you're having right now affecting your relationship with your students? It's not just like asking teachers to go into the classroom and do something. Um, it's quite different actually. It's saying we are a continuous development species and we need to be every year addressing growth and our ability to manage emotions. And finally, right, we've got to update or overhaul these outdated policies. Um, whether it be suspension policies um, or others that are you know, perpetuating inequities. So a few last things. One, with very generous support from um, the Dalio Education uh, Group, we were able to build a course that is a little bit like the kit. So I'm going back to this. This is, this is our temporary solution to a permanent problem. But what we found was that not every school this year is prepared to take on a model like Ruler, a systemic approach to SEL. And we wanna make sure we get teachers some basic strategies to help them manage their anxiety and stress and to help them help their students. Just so you know, we launched this two weeks ago. We have 22,000 educators registered in the state of Connecticut. 
So it's unbelievable. It's free. And um, the, there are eight areas that are in this course. It's an introduction and why it matters, helping educators identify their emotions, managing our own emotions through behavior change or doing things, managing our emotions by changing how we think, teaching, really making sure people understand the principles of anti-racism and cultural responsive pedagogy, helping teachers be more accurate, identifying their students' emotions and helping the students to manage theirs and putting it all together. So my hope is that you will share this. It's self-directed. You can do it at night. You can do it while you go to the bathroom. Just kidding. Um, I don't care when you do it. Um, but um, that's the website. You just sign up. Um, you can um, pass this to every teacher in your school. You can ask your superintendent to upload the roster for your entire district. And every teacher will get a, a link to make it anonymous. So just yceiorg slash SEO course. I hope you take it seriously and enjoy it. I think it's very helpful. And in the spirit of time, um, may I ask all of you to give yourselves the permission to feel. If I had a magic like pocket of like dust that was like permission to feel dust, I would just like, you know, I hereby grant you all the permission to feel all emotions. Can we all strive to be those emotion scientists and not the emotion judges? Can we help everyone in our schools learn that these skills are about accepting all feelings um, and using them wisely? You know, in terms of not being a kid, this is, these are harder skills to learn than many of the traditional so-called hard skills. It's life's work. I never in my entire life would have thought that I would have trouble dealing with my anxiety and fear in my 50s. And this pandemic has been a wake-up call to me in terms of the work I need to do on myself. And I'm like a, supposedly an expert in this space. People say to me like, Mark, are you doing okay? I'm like, not really. And they're like, but you're the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. And I'm like, yeah, that's my job. But I got a lot of inner work to do still. Um, right, we've got to be the role models as best we can. Can't tell you how many adults in schools I've learned they just don't want to apologize, they hold on to grudges, they don't forgive, they don't really want to work on repairing their relationships or get the help they need. I think we all need to focus on systemic change and embrace its complexity. And honestly, like we just can't give up. This is just too important. So if you're interested in apps, we're, we have a mood meter app that's gonna be redone this year. I'm so excited about it. It's gonna be an emotional fitness center. Um, the founder of Pinterest is supporting this project and we're gonna make this really, really cool. And um, if you're interested in reading um, about this work, you can get my book. You can just go to any Amazon site or my website. Also on my website, there are free articles that we've written that are helpful. You can join my virtual book club. Um, 7,000 people have joined. It's been super fun. And um, we've been just going through chapters and having rich discussions and then have guests on. Like Thursday night, I have a guest who's an expert in uh, uh, racial differences and emotion perception. We're gonna have really rich conversations about the errors that many white people make in reading emotion. Um, and just lots of just cool stuff on there. So let me ask us all to take, a nice inhale and exhale. Maybe shake out our necks a little bit. Victor Frankl, as many of you know, was a Holocaust survivor. He wrote a book many of us read in high school, Man's Search for Meaning. Between stimulus and response, there is space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and our freedom. So to my friends in Connecticut, please be a friend of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. Please, please, please be our friend. Um, please disseminate the course, that website that I share with you to every educator you know in the state of Connecticut. Put it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and just get it out there. 
And if your school is interested in taking SEL seriously, I ask you to reach out. And one last thing is, if you're interested um, in participating in research, I'll be also sending you a link um, where you can uh, become part of the longitudinal study we're doing across Connecticut and beyond to help educators and counselors understand their own wellness. And so I will send that link out through Laura or Laura. I make everybody Spanish. Um, and, um, and maybe you'll want to join. You'll get five times. It's, we, we actually pay participants to do it. You'll get to do this over the course of a year and, um, and get like a feedback report about the year of uh, this year and how you've been doing. So Laura, thank you for inviting me, everyone. Um, I'll just end by saying, and I hope you agree, that it really is our moral obligation, especially during these difficult times, to ensure that all kids get an emotion education. And that starts with we adults, us adults being the role models. So thank you, everybody. God bless you. Be well. Use those strategies and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, so grateful that you're able to join the Connecticut School Counselor Association and all the counselors here to, to learn a little bit more about the um, Ruler program and just this permission to feel and allowing that space for our students. And the reminder that um, being vulnerable is okay um, and being our true selves and, and allowing us to be human, which we often forget as mm -hmm. educators and role models. Um, I am so grateful for all of you who are joining us. I, we have so many more events happening this week, so please be sure to check out everything that's happening. We have a lot of college and career pieces that are coming up this week, as well as I think a 504, and um, I'm, there's so much going on, mm -hmm. including I believe leaf peeping is happening at the end of this week, so getting that chance to do something for yourself and relax as well. Um, if you have not renewed your membership, because I just got mine today, um, please be sure to renew your membership for the year. As moving forward, we will be working on um, making sure that our members are receiving the best support that they can possibly get with our organization platform and advocacy. Mark, again, thank you so thank much. You. And anyone, feel free to send questions, comments, concerns, anything. Um, um, I'm telling you, I'm on this mission to make Connecticut the first emotionally intelligent state, and I'm not going to sleep until it happens. So, um, but I can't do it alone. I really, 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 really want all of you to be involved. Um, and I will get Laura. I keep on wanting to call you Laura. It's okay. <laughs> uh, you're Italian now, just so you know. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, I'll get you the link. I'll send you the powerpoints. I'll send you the link to the surveys, and I'll send the link to the course. Wonderful. And we will put those up on a, our Connecticut School Counselor Association resource page, um, probably under, um, I think we have a social emotional learning, but if not under the COVID section, as we, that course is specific to helping our educators through this moment in time. Cool. All Thank right. You Thank so you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone.